what was maybe the main, like the number one thing you learned about yourself as an entrepreneur going through and building ClipIt? Yeah, so ClipIt was a, a pivot from City Pockets, which is what I, you know, started first and then uh, that didn't kind of work, so we had to pivot the company. But same company, same investors. Um, you know, it was my first company, it was my first startup, and there was a lot that I didn't know. Um, so I definitely made some mistakes there, but um, I, I always believed in creating solutions for problems you are facing at a time. Welcome, Cheryl. Thanks for being here. So you've been you've been going at this for a long time. You've been mm -hmm. doing the startup founder entrepreneur thing for a while now. Over ten like. years, I think. Yeah, yeah. At, at least. But it seems like you've you've accomplished so many things in such a short period of time. And I'm not I'm not just saying that. Like it's it's pretty fascinating. I'm excited to dive into it. Why do you keep going? Um, I I don't know. Inner drive. Um, maybe a chip in the shoulder a little bit for wanting to prove myself. Um, I think that's that's mostly it. <laughs> yeah. But also, I guess the, the belief that I can really do something great, and when I do something great, then I'm like, I can do, I can do even better, like a greater job. So um, I always tell myself at some point I'll stop, you know, and relax, yeah. um, and I'll know when I feel like I've I've achieved it. I feel like I'm close to it this time around. So. Yeah, I don't amazing. Know. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about. I I know you've you've now founded a, a few companies. You've been sort of early at a few companies. Um, which of the companies so far, in your mind, was did you find the most enjoyment doing? Hmm. The current one, really. Yeah, I'm most passionate about it, and I wake up every day feeling motivated um, to change the world. I, I really feel like this company that I'm running right now is a very mission-driven company that is truly improving outcomes in the world. So yeah, it, it's fun. Amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to talk more about Tiny Health, the company that you're working on now. Um, before we do that, I, I want to talk about something that you did in your career that I thought was, I thought was really interesting, which was this company called Magic. Mm -hmm. um, this was, I think, after you had already had a couple of successes. I think you had already sold a company at this point. Mm -hmm. And it appears that you went to Malaysia to help with a startup innovation program. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? What was MAGIC? Mm, yeah, it, it stood for the, the Malaysian Global um, Innovation. I, I'm trying to remember it now. The Malaysian Global Innovation and Creativity Center is what it stood nice. for. Yeah, it's a mouthful, which is why they shortened it to Magic. Um, so this was right after I um, exited with my first company, um, City Pockets, or we eventually pivoted to Reclip It, was what was acquired by Walmart Labs at a time. So after my, my one-year golden handcuffs there, um, I was headhunted by the White House uh, team in the U.S. at the time, along with the government of Malaysia. So I, I'm originally from Malaysia, uh, born and bred there, and came to the U.S. on a government scholarship when I was 18. So I came here for my engineering degree at Cornell. And so um, I believe the government of Malaysia at the time was looking for a Malaysian entrepreneur who had exited in Silicon Valley. So they um, made a trip here with the White House team um, to find someone to go back to Southeast Asia to lead an innovation ecosystem uh, uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and back then, you know, Southeast Asia was, it was really Singapore that is sort of leading the pack in um, technology startups at the time. They had a lot of government incentives, tax incentives for investors and entrepreneurs to go there to, to found, found companies. But uh, the rest of Southeast Asia was still relatively unknown, like Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand had amazing startups that are still not thinking big enough. So um, there was a plan to basically hire someone, a successful entrepreneur from Silicon Valley to to go to Southeast Asia to lead this ecosystem. And I was very uh, honored and, and like, you know, lucky to be picked um, to lead 
a $50 million um, government funded agency basically to spur that ecosystem. So I left Walmart Labs at a time. It was a huge decision to leave Silicon Valley at a time because I just yeah. uh, sold my company and, you know, I was sort of having a good time, you know, re- finally being able to relax and, you know, my network was, was um, you know, I was building my network and to leave all that to go back to Southeast Asia to run this agency for a couple of years, it was a two-year stint. Um, it was a tough decision, but ultimately I felt like I wouldn't be where I was without the help of the government at the time with the scholarship. And so I felt like this was something I couldn't turn down, a $50 million funded agency to do what I felt was right for entrepreneurs oh. in my home region. Um, so I, I, I went home for two years. Amazing. Why did the White House here care so deeply about that? Oh, yeah. So that was uh, during the Obama administration times uh, when I, I believe he kickstarted this program called um, Global Entrepreneurship Summit, where he would go around different nations, different countries uh, in the world to um, spur the innovation ecosystem in those countries. So he was uh, coming to Malaysia basically in April of 2020, 2014. And uh, that really kickstarted this movement back in Malaysia and Southeast Asia to build this magic um, agency. And the decision was made to, uh, the $50 million was was sort of like the idea for funding this ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it was just like working with the White House team to um, built this conference basically in Malaysia. So um, President Obama at the time basically came to Malaysia to launch Magic uh, when I went back. So wow. April 2014, I met him. And um, yeah, that was a wild, pretty wild ride. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's got to be wild. Mm-hmm. Um, so this, this was an opportunity you pursued more out of sort of passion and fulfillment mm-hmm. than like... Well, more like giving back, frankly. Yeah. Because I felt like I, um, this was an, a chance for me to give back. You know, as an entrepreneur, um, I, I had a lot of um, help, mentorship, and, and favors from a lot of other entrepreneurs, a lot of different mentors. Um, and so this was a chance for me to give back to my roots as well, where I, you know, going back to where I was born and helping other entrepreneurs succeed. So, yeah, yeah different career tracked but you know it was always um yeah fulfilling for me to have done that when did you move to the states when i was 18 so that was like 2002 and what Mm -hmm. tell me tell me about some of your mentors that you had you know coming up as a as a youth and then even when you moved to america it was like a new place for you to you know kind of uh put your flag in the ground maybe tell me about some of your mentors in malaysia and then some of the mentors you had when you when you got here I, you know, I don't think I had mentors in Malaysia. I was like a teenager at the time, but I, I always did have an entrepreneurial streak in the sense that my mom really was my role model. She was like a business person and she had a uh, home office. So growing up, I would always see her, you know, being the leader of her team, uh, the CEO of her company and aspiring to be like that. And I would always have these business ideas and things I wanted to sell to my uh, you know, t- my schoolmates and my mom would always encourage that and taught me about financial independence early on. Um, and I definitely had a couple of business ventures growing up. Um, so, so that kind of, I would say, yeah, if anything, my mom would be my role model. Um, but she would always also push me to, you know, sort of like go for it, you know, like coming to the U S where I had no family at all, um, would have been scary for a lot of parents to kind of encourage the kids to just pursue but my mom and dad was pretty much like just just go for it um so i was very fortunate to get a full scholarship to study at cornell because it wasn't a cheap scholarship um so i yeah coming here was adventurous for me not knowing anyone it was a, a way for me to start fresh and pursue my dreams um i had always just like you know learn about the U.S. culture through Safe by the Bell, <laughs> Beverly Hills 90210 Old, and, and that was what I was exposed to when I was growing up, you know? And so coming here, it was kind of like, you know, the American dream where if you work hard and if you are passionate about something and you put your mind to it, you can truly achieve, you know, anything that you want. And so 
I am kind of living that life now and having been here for nearly like, I don't know, how long has it been? Like over two decades now? You know, it's, it's definitely, I'm now an American, so I've gotten my citizenship here and yeah, it's been a blast. That's amazing. I don't, I don't know that I've ever heard an immigrant say saved by the bell was like the <laughs> thing, you know, but I love that show. It's a great show. Yeah. It shows you how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I think you hear like the sort of Holly, Hollywood headlines. I don't know that saved by the bell was ever that, but it was, it was an amazing show. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that's cool. <laughs> So I want to talk about, I would definitely want to get into, um, you know, talking about your experience with On Deck and SVB and some of the like EIR type roles that you did. Mm -hmm. Before we do that, um, let's talk about, let's talk about Clip It. Let's talk about this company that you started that was ultimately acquired. What was maybe the main, like the number one thing you learned about yourself as an entrepreneur going through and building Clip It? Um, yeah, so Reclipit was a, a pivot from City Pockets, which is what I, you know, started first, and then uh, that didn't kind of work, so we had to pivot the company. But same company, same investors. Um, you know, it was my first company, it was my first startup, and there was a lot that I didn't know. Um, so I definitely made some mistakes there, but um, I, I always believed in creating solutions for problems you are facing at a time. And the first company, City Pockets, that we built was uh, during the era of Groupon or Daily Deals, if you remember that yeah, time, sure. in uh, 2010, 11. Yeah. Yep. And then, you know, a ton of Groupon copycats sprouted from that. So I was one of them buying a lot of Daily Deals from a lot of companies and forgetting to use them. So I was trying to build a digital wallet back when the crypto didn't exist yet. Um, basically to manage all the vouchers. They were called vouchers at a time because they were currency that you prepaid for, right? You would buy a $50 voucher for uh, $100 voucher for $50. And so I was trying to solve my own problem of tracking them and remembering to use them. Um, and, you know, so that was the product we built at first. Um, and I still, till today, I, I've been building companies where I, I'm solving my own problems. Um, then when it came to, when that didn't work, and I can tell more about that if you wanted to, to know why it didn't work, um, we pivoted to a, basically a business model that was starting to work, which is like more B2B, um, digitizing weekly ads from retailers like Walmart and Safeway, Target, um, and digitizing a lot of the paper coupons that, you know, Midwest moms would clip and take to the grocery mm, store to yeah. claim. So that was a pivot from vouchers when that whole business model failed into more digitizing coupons. And that was something I couldn't identify with that, you know, it, I wasn't solving my own problem at this point. It was someone else's problem. And it was just hard for me to get fully into it. And that's ultimately why we decided to sell the company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd love to understand what didn't work definitely in the first company, um, you know, what you learned by going through that. But then also I think pivoting, you know, every startup has to do it at least once or twice or three times. Um, mm -hmm. But some pivots are a lot bigger than other pivots. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to understand like, once you, why it didn't work, once it didn't work, like you decide to make this pivot and, and what that process was like to ultimately land on, okay, this is the thing that we're going to go build and that we're going to double down on. And then did it eventually start working? Like, was it clear a year later or two mm -hmm. years later that that pivot was like the right move for the company? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we started, um, this was in New York. Um, I was a management consultant, um, out of, um, my master's degree. So I, I did my bachelor's and then I moved to Arizona actually to work for a company. And then I went back to do my master's. I got another scholarship from Cornell. So then after my master's, I moved to New York when management consulting was still a, th a thing and really glitzy and glamorous because you're flying Isn't everywhere. Still that today? No, not really. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, no, um, it was, you know, back then, but, um, so, but when I graduated in 08 at a time and moved to New York and got my first job out of, 
uh, New York as a management consultant, it was the downturn, financial crisis happened. And so a lot of the consulting jobs I did was um, cost cutting, frankly, firing IT people and outsourcing to India. So it wasn't the fancy strategy work that you think. It was pretty grunt work and, uh, you know, it, but I learned a lot, right? How to be very efficient with money and how to, you know, consolidate and things like that. But it was, it was pretty, you know, soul sucking, frankly, right? You'd fly somewhere and then work like your 80, 100 hour week on something that you weren't really passionate about. And then I would have these crazy Monday blues where I would come back from, you know, you know, consulting, you'd work Monday through, through Thursday uh, offsite at the client site. And then Thursday, you'd fly somewhere like Aruba or Hawaii or what have you. And you would spend that weekend there and then come back on Monday to your client site. So my life was kind of like that for a whole year in 08, 09. But my Monday blues were so terrible that I, I had some pretty severe like depression issues with that. And it, it finally just got too much that when the financial crises hit and all these like, you know, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley were laying off people and all that, I decided to quit and not live that life anymore. And w just wanted to found my first company, got together with um, an old friend from Cornell, who's an engineer who became my co-founder and built that first company. Um, it was, you know, sort of like, um, like I mentioned, the the craze of the daily deals at a time. And I just, I had a ton of ideas I wanted to pursue. And this was just one that I, um, kind of, it was simple enough that it got me started. Um, in the end, it didn't, you know, uh, no, winding back. So this was 08, 09. So when the tech scene in New York was not there yet, you know, it was, the New York tech scene grew out of the financial crises, yeah. which is kind of what I wanted to mention. And so, a lot of these fi finance people and consultants left, right, to create startups. So we were in that Foursquare, you know, when Foursquare, Etsy, and all that were, were just popping up, and New York startup scene was just buzzing. And so it was, it was good timing as a female founder, too. There, there weren't too many of us at a time. So it was easy for me to get a lot of media support, a lot of PR, um, you know, chances to speak at a lot of panels and events and things like that to give talks mentor I was kind of mentoring almost every startup weekend you can imagine at the time um, and learning at the same time so that was great to be honest to see how that community was being built um, how a like you know how a startup ecosystem literally just sprouted right and a lot of it was founders really coming together sharing their ideas being open about it um, where, where before, you know, New York wasn't like that, right? Yeah. So that energy was fascinating, and that really helped me in that first um, product I built in City Pockets. Uh, we were on like ABC, Fox News, you know, for free, CNN, Wall Street Journal. We we did so amazing through PR. But ultimately, when Groupon um, IPO'd in, I think, 2012, that whole space crashed, right, and consolidated. Um, and so even though we were building something that was basically not a Groupon copycat, but a wallet to hold all these da uh, daily deals, and we had a secondary marketplace too to resell coupons that you couldn't use or vouchers you couldn't use, uh, it was really hard to raise that next round of funding. We had to raise a million for our seed round, and it maybe took me six months to raise that funding. Um, it was really tough as a first-time entrepreneur too, um, and I... Like, you know, I can go into that if you want me to, but I got my first check um, kind of coming out to South by Southwest here in Austin, oh, actually. Yeah. And there's a whole story how I slept on my friend's Let's futon. Just do the whole story. Well, I, you know, I was, you know, I quit my job as a management consultant, right? Yeah. And I was living in a fancy apartment in Gramercy at a time in New York. And I'm like, you know, all these like designer clothes. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to how am I going to be an entrepreneur and be scrappy if I'm living in this apartment? So I decided to rent my fancy apartment out and put all my fancy bags away and sleep on a futon in my friend's apartment in his living room. And I, I'm not going to move into an, I told myself I'm not going to move into an apartment until I raise my, I raise my first round because I wanted to live like, uh, you know, <laughs> at the times one of the, um, media outlets in New York wrote about my, I think, $50 budget 
food budget a week in New York and how I lived on kale and quinoa. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was so scrappy and I really loved it. Um, and I wanted to because I wanted to feel the grind and feel the pressure to actually get to the next stage. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I, I got sponsors to buy my flight to Austin at a time because I really wanted to go to South by and uh, rented my futon in my friend's living room for $50 a night for 10 days that bought my, um, you know, kind of paid for my expenses to Austin from New York at the time. So it was that whole story, you know, and then someone paid for my batch to South by. Um, I pitched a few like VCs and angels here and I got my first check, my, 25, my first $25,000 here. And that set me off, uh, you know, once you get your first check then it yeah. becomes a little bit easier right as you know wow. so anyway so that that really was my sc- the scrappy days and i still have a little bit of a lot of scrappiness now um but you know it, it was sort of like uh, tough times but fun you know anyway fast forward um the you know i realized that you know sometimes we we chase after like a shiny thing new thing and you you built something that is too reliant on a platform. So at a time for me, it was the Daily Deal platform, right? We were building a a whole business model on top of Groupons and Living Social and all these companies. So when that crashed, then you crash along with it. Even though my my pitch was that we would start off with Daily Deals, but we're a digital wallet that held digital currency. So we'd eventually do gift cards your airline miles, anything that had an expiration date that had value to it, right? It didn't matter because it was so tight to daily deals to begin with. So it was just no investors would want to even meet with me for my my next round. Mm. So that's what prompted us to make the hard decision to pivot into uh, a more, you know, stable business model, which is the old couponing industry, which I was less familiar with, frankly. It was based on the affiliate model. So pennies, you get pennies out of every clip, right? Every uh, view. So something that I now looking back wish um, I, I actually didn't pivot to that I should have just shut down the company and start fresh on a new idea that I was truly passionate about. Um, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty. You know, yeah. at, at the time, I, I really, you know, again, I took money from friends and family and I really wanted to make sure yeah, I returned their, yeah. yeah, return their money. So I kept at it. And eventually we did return the money with the acquisition. So I'm, I'm ultimately, um, you know, glad that I went through with it. It, yeah. it was just really tough times, right? You know, yeah, I could have said like, let's just, you know, like shut this company down and build a new one, but then I would have disappointed those investors. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah. That's a great story. Mm-hmm. So you're like, you're like one of the OGs in the New York tech scene. You're like one of the first. Yeah, like I would say that, that first is second wave of entrepreneurs in, in New York. And so I still have my network there. Uh, but then I, I did go, I did move to um, the Bay Area when I pivoted to reclip it. Um, so then I have my network out there more recently. Yeah, amazing. Mm-hmm. So uh, management consulting or startups, which one is more taxing on the body and the mind? Oh, well. You know, it's a different kind of taxing, right? When you're doing something that's so sucking when and you're putting in that 80, 100 hours a week, yeah. it's not the same as when you're doing something so passionate and you're you're grinding, but it's a good grind, you yeah. know? So, yeah, very different. I would prefer the, the passionate grind any day. Yeah, totally. Yeah, you talked about, you said the word scrappy, and it made me think about how, how do you feel like, it seems like your scrappiness hasn't, been lost you still have it but how is how have you started to channel your scrappiness to be more make may, maybe make more productive use out of your scrappiness today than when you were a first-time founder mm. yeah that's an interesting question um well so okay we this for this company um i'm building tiny health now which is a gut microbiome testing platform that's focused on moms and babies we're the first ever in the world doing that, but we also have adult gut tests if you're interested. Um, so for this company, I... Did you bring one? I didn't. <laughs> I, say, I should let's, have. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can send you one. Okay. I'm going to see you tonight. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm actually not going home. Oh, so, you're not yeah. going to okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a long trip up here. Yeah. Um, but so this company was, you know, my second venture funded company. I started a few, one nonprofit in between. Yeah. Um, so this time I wanted to be sure of this idea. And I actually invested 50K of my own money in the first sort of experiment. So I had nine moms who were pregnant when I was pregnant and I wanted to take their stool and vaginal samples and their babies in the first year. So I wanted to see results if the data that I had then collected and sequenced would result in a report that would be actionable and useful for parents. So when, so I waited one year for it. So it was a kind of very patient. Um, and I was like, you know, I had just give, given birth to my second child at a time. So that waiting period was sort of, you know, also time to focus on my family. Uh, then when my son was a year and when I had that data back, that's when I raised my first uh, round of funding for Tiny Health. So I raised four and a half mil, pretty much on a deck, uh, just an idea, but with data, you know, that and, and showing investors that I had put in my own money to prove that this has some, some legs behind. Um, and it was during the heyday, right? It was April 2021. 20, so it was at a peak of frothiness. Yeah. Um, and I, because this is not an off the shelf test, we're building everything from scratch, all the IP. Um, I, when I raised money, I had hired my first five scientists um, to really focus on the R and D. Um, but I was very scrappy. I didn't do any sort of, there was no point in hiring um, any marketing person. It was, you know, we were very focused on the science and I had eventually brought on a product manager and an engineer in house, which I would highly recommend to, to bring on any staff that any team member that is crucial for your tech products. So an engineer rather than outsourcing it. Um, and, and a freelance, it, eventually we did bring on a freelance marketer when we were ready to go to market. But I can explain on that. Those are little tips that I would like to impart uh, yeah. in, in lessons learned. Um, but basically the scrappiness comes in, you know, acting like I had just raised a million dollars. I didn't want to act like I was I had raised four and a half mil. I knew that was pretty insane at a time that I only got that four and a half because I was a, a repeat successful founder. Yeah. Um, and I got the valuation I, I wanted, right? But I didn't want to act like that. So I told myself I would act as if I'd only wait, raise a mil or two and act like I had limited funds. Nice. At the time, I remember my, my, one of my investors were like, Cheryl, you're not spending money. Why? You're too slow. Like, you know, you should be going all out and just doing marketing already. I'm like, no. I'm not, I'm not ready. Their tune a little bit. <laughs> yeah. No, now they're grateful. Now they're like, right. you did the right thing. Yeah. You were, you know, you did all the right things. So I'm like, okay. Uh, thankfully I was still, I'm still very scrappy in the way I operate. Cause I feel like, you know, in the same way that I, um, you know, rented my fancy apartment out in Gramercy and lived in the food, like on my friend's living room futon there there's i want a certain sense of like we're not there yet we have to earn it you yeah. know and that's how, kind of how i i feel like i, I run my companies mm, there's a lot there i love it i think it's great i want to talk about the company that you're working on because i think it's this is one of those companies that when you initially see it um you realize it's like part of the one percent of companies that are really doing something noble um why did you decide to start this company? Tiny Health. Yeah. Out of my own experiences so, um, with my two births. So um, I, I was an ERR at Silicon Valley Bank. Oh, actually not, not yet. So th this is, uh, I have so many lives. This was when I got pregnant with my first child um, when I was CMO at Hack Reactor, which is a coding bootcamp uh, for JavaScript the best in the US, I dare say. Um, and so I, my baby was breached. So there was a high likelihood that I would have a C-section. So I was researching, you know, what that would mean for my baby's lifelong health. And I, I realized that, you know, the mom passes on her microbiome, her vaginal microbiome to the baby, if the baby passes through that track. So a C-section would mean the baby would bypass that that route uh, and that would mean they're not seated properly with the microbiome of the mom. So the baby is sterile in the womb and when they 
are born, that's when they get the first flush of microbes from the mom or the environment. So if they're not getting it from the mom's vaginal or um, gut, you know, through this, some fecal fluid coming out when you're pushing, sounds gross, but it's how nature yeah, intends yeah. for immune systems of babies to be built. Um, if you're not acquiring it from the mom, you may be acquiring it from the hospital environment, which tends to have more antibiotic resistant bacteria or if you're giving birth at home or whatever environment that is, right? So I, I realized that 80% um, of our immune system as an adult lives in our gut. It's dictated by what bacteria we do or don't have, whether it's beneficial or unfriendly. And it's being, you know, it's being developed in the first 1,000 days of life. So the first three years of life and more importantly, in the first few months. And so if your immune system is so tight to bacteria in your gut in early life, then it's, it's so crucial. And then when, I, when, you dig, you know, when you go through the rabbit hole and digging through all this research, you find that one in two babies or kids have a chronic condition like eczema, allergies, eventually asthma. Um, and that, that is now like there's a lot of science showing that it's linked to early life gut imbalances. And, you know, from modern lifestyle, from increased C-sections, from antibiotic use during pregnancy, during labor, um, in, in early life, because a lot of kids get ear infection these days and get antibiotics. All those things may be life-saving, but they have unintended effects on the baby's microbiome and the gut development. And that leads to a lot of chronic conditions. So it's very profound for me when I uncovered all this research during pregnancy, actually, and I was desperately trying to avoid the C-section. Uh, but in the end, I, I did have to have a C-section. I tried to labor and do it the natural way. But, you know, it's just sometimes you just can't control these things, right? Yeah. yeah so, you know, but I did a lot of... Um, I also found papers showing that you can restore a baby's gut. So I did something called a vaginal seeding. So you can put a gauze in your vagina for an hour before the, the C-section. And when a baby's out, you can um, sort of like swab the baby's mouth and face to yeah, mimic the, the vaginal canal. And there's two studies now showing that the baby who, who were swabbed looked more like a vaginally born baby. So that was like, that definitely sparked my interest. And um, I found papers showing that extended breastfeeding can restore a baby's gut even more than, um, you know, sort of like how the baby was born. Um, breastfeeding is, is um, more impactful to the baby's gut health than, than anything else. Um, so I did that. I, there were certain strains of probiotics that you can give the baby to restore their gut and not all probiotics are equal. So there's all these things that I was learning and there's something called the C-section signature that, a ba that babies could be born with. Even vaginally born babies could have the signature, which means there's a certain pattern of bacteria in the baby's gut that are linked to these chronic conditions like eczema. So by one year of age, if you measure the baby's microbiome, and if that C-section signature is gone, then their risk for asthma would have been reduced by three times. So I was doing all these things, breastfeeding, um, making homemade kefir, probiotics, um, and I was trying to find a way to measure my baby's microbiome, and I couldn't find a baby gut test. You know, as, as product people, founders you want to measure if you can't measure something you can't improve it right and so i was looking for a gut test in the market and all i could find were, were adult gut tests which i then learned was incomparable you can't use what's healthy for an adult for a baby because the baby's immune system and gut is so immature so i was just kind of like you know i was just how, how is this not a thing you know if this is there's so much science backing it um, that I decided when I was pregnant with my son that I would create this company because now I wanted to measure his microbiome in case I needed another C-section with him because um, my daughter eventually did um, have eczema despite um, what I did, but it was very mild, thankfully. So I think some of what I did probably mitigated her, um, her symptoms and she has some food sensitivities um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, like we, we now have data on what her gut looks like and I'm trying to heal her gut. Um, but
but my son then was fashionably born at home. So I, like, this is the April 2020, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and I chose a home birth this time because I had a couple run-ins at the hospital being given antibiotics that I didn't need, you know, at a time that I, I just kind of decided that I wanted to try the home birth route. Um, and he, he has no symptoms. He has no eczema, no food allergies, really different health than my daughter. And I've measured his gut since he was a month old. Um, so that, that kind of, my, my journey made me feel like I was that mom reading all this research papers and taking my kids' health in my own hands. Um, I learned that a lot of cutting edge research doesn't get to medical practice for 10, 15 years because it's a whole process, right? And sometimes people who are publishing papers aren't really in necessarily incentivized to bring this to the market. Yeah. So I think we, you know, entrepreneurs like us have the opportunity to um, really bring these this cutting edge science to life and we want to be the company who can empower parents to know what's happening in their, their kids' gut, their baby's guts, and get to the root cause of things. You take a baby with eczema to a doctor and they'll likely prescribe steroids or, you know, prescription drugs. And it's, it's, it's rare that a doctor has, you know, the nutrition angle or maybe prevention angle. It's a lot about how do you mitigate the symptoms, but I want to get to the root cause of it. And through all my research, the root cause is imbalances in the gut. And it's so important for their lifelong health that why wouldn't you, want to you know impact and restore your baby's gut um before you know your symptoms get worse pretty amazing uh thank you for sharing that what what are, where's the company at today you have a do you have a product that's out to market that is available for people to buy to mm -hmm. what where are you at today yeah so i i mentioned earlier i um this was an idea in april 2021 when i raised my funding it took us one whole year to complete that r d um, so we launched our product in April 2022, so 11 months ago. Uh, it's been almost a year, and we just crossed our one mil revenue mark, <laughs> which nice. I'm really right. proud of. Um, I don't think, you know, my previous company had not making that much money. So it definitely feels good that we it feels like there's a huge demand for this product from parents, and we're truly helping them. Uh, we've been profitable. Um, with every kit that we sell, we've been growing 40% month over month since we launched. Um, and we actually have a, a, a suite of gut tests for the whole family, so not just the, the baby. So our, our kind of specialty is zero to three years of age, and that's the product that is the first in the market. No one else has that. Uh, for pregnant moms um, or postpartum moms, trying to conceive moms. We also have one for older kids, three to 18, and for regular adults who are not um, trying to conceive or like men <laughs> and we have a vaginal test too because the baby passes through the vaginal canal so you want to make sure your vaginal health is uh, in good shape because that also influences whether or not one may have preterm labor or some other pregnancy complications the vaginal um, health is actually equally important to the gut health as well so you have like five or six products mm -hmm. in the market today yeah what is the gut health um product look like for you know a baby or to choose your use case like wh what do you actually do what does the product mm -hmm. look like mm -hmm. does it get shipped to you in the mail yeah do you yeah. do something ship it back kind of like a dna test yeah like yeah it yeah it's we're kind of like the 23 and me for gut health i would oh, say okay. so it's an cool. at-home test kit where you would buy online and you get get um the kit the test kit at home it's basically like a q-tip swab it's really easy and if you're a parent and changing diapers anyway poop, poopy diapers you're just swabbing a little bit of stool um, and putting it into this kind of like tube that has a drying drying desiccant in it that preserves the bacteria the dna of the bacteria and it gets shipped to our lab so you just drop it in a prepaid mailer into a usps box our lab in virginia gets it processes it and we extract the DNA of the microbes. We use this new technology called shotgun metagenomics sequencing, which is basically the gold standard in all microbiome research now. And we, Tiny Health, uh, we're a fully remote team. We get the raw files back, basically all the genetic DNA code of the microbes, and we 
encode that into something that you can understand. So we can tell you you have 10% bifidobacteria infantis or 1% E. coli and a certain strain and what it means. And then the, the report that you get back is a um, virtual, like a, um, an, a web interactive web portal that you can browse. And we summarize, you know, all the gut bacteria in your gut, bacteria, fungi, parasites, if you have any, all that kind of stuff and what it means for your health. So, f you know, we can tell if you have good metabolic health, um, if you have any um, bacteria that's associated to poor sleep, constipation, a lot of these, these digestive, di digestive system um, kind of issues. Uh, so we have all those for adults, but for babies, basically the science is stronger for babies because they're the only diet they eat is really breast milk, right? Or formula. And that's a different story. F formula fed babies have a slightly more diverse microbiome, which you don't want in a baby. You want as low diversity as possible. So when we eat, our microbiome becomes more complex based on our diet, our supplements, our lifestyle, whether or not you have dogs or pets and how much nature you're exposed to influences our microbiome. For a baby in the first six months, they're pretty much not exposed to a whole lot of things. So their microbiomes are very simple and very low in diversity. And therefore, the science there is stronger for what should be there and what shouldn't be there that associates with health, good health or disease. So that's why it's, it's so, such a no-brainer why this product should exist for parents because there is something truly that you can do about it uh, in terms of we're very empowering when it comes to breastfeeding because when a mom, you know, you can, you, you kind of know that breastfeeding is, is good for the child, but you, it's a, it's a, a concept, right? You, you, you yeah, know, you understand why. Yeah. You, you can't yeah. see tangibly, but when you see your microbes continuing to transfer through that breast milk to your baby mm. and you're, you're seeing, if you measure the mom's gut and you measure the, the baby's gut, you can see that same strain going to baby from the mom. Yeah. It's really empowering. And you see it pushing out a lot of bad bacteria. So with the C-section, most C-section babies have, uh, like I said, hospital antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So the E. coli, the Klebsiella, Salmonella-type bacteria strains. And it could dominate the baby's gut when there's no protective bacteria in the baby's gut. And through breastfeeding, you see that mom's good bacteria, if she has them, pushing out the crowding out the unfriendly bacteria so that whole shift that you see from measuring the first sample into the next sample is really motivating for breastfeeding moms for example or if even to reduce the guilt in um parents who had just been through a c-section or yeah. antibiotics wow. um so yeah like and and kids who have eczema a lot of these um chronic conditions they do come in and we do often t detect a lot of bad bacteria in their guts and a lot of moms now give probiotics to their infants, but some infants don't need it. There is actually such a thing as over supplementing with probiotics. Too much of good, a good thing keeps diversity out. And when the baby's starting solids, you want that diversity to increase. And you don't want the probiotics to, to hamper that, right? So we, we think that we're moving towards uh, precision nutrition, precision supplementation it shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all solution for people especially when it comes to your baby's health now are you providing um like a content library as well on your site because what you just described a lot of it doesn't it all correlates to the test but how does a parent necessarily know based on the oh, test like yeah. oh we should feed our kids oh yeah we have a, a, a huge like action plan that comes with the test and that was one of the, the first philosophies when i created this product i didn't want to just give parents data that they don't know what to do with yeah. it has to be actionable right and every action uh is like cited there's reference and we're really picky about which papers we we show oh, they wow. have to be uh, you know, you can run a study that's weak where the power is not high, you know, like N equals to eight, you know, it's not really meaningful. Yeah. So our scientists are really, you know, um, they're pretty anal about the quality of the study. So anything that gets into our action plan, especially for mom and babies, are validated. And we like to give people options. So you can make changes through um, diet 
Uh, some people are more into like foods and um, and all that. Some people are more into supplements. So what specific probiotics or other supplements that you can take that could influence your gut microbiome? And again, a lot of companies now, especially for adults, right? They say they have certain gut benefits. Um, and, you know, technically we can measure, we can see if what they claim is true. So I like to think that we are not building a D2C company. We're building a, D, a microbiome data platform where we truly know what supplements are working and not working for uh, people. And we, we also know, for example, for babies, because their, ba their microbiomes are so... Uh, immature and low in diversity, we know who kind of has better strains, so to speak. So in the future, we can, uh, you know, the, the vision is that we can leverage this data to improve the science of microbiome health for not just babies, but adults too. We can maybe culture certain strains of bacteria and patent our own probiotics. Um, that fits certain individuals. So not like, again, not one size fits all, but certain strains that can work for certain types of communities. Um, maybe we'd find microbiome therapeutics for babies born via C-section or who needed antibiotics in early life. So longer term, that's the larger vision of the company. Yeah, there's a lot there. Is to measure, I, I remember like uh, 15 years ago or so, um, yeah, so, something like that. 15 years ago, I remember I had a friend whose mom was really into health and I was having some stomach related issues. And I remember she asked me what my, what my blood type was. And I told her and she pulled out this little card and on the card it had every blood type and it had foods that that blood type didn't do well with. Right. Mm. So like there was like 20 or so foods on each of these blood types and we reviewed the foods and she's like, which of these foods do you eat on a regular basis? And it was tomatoes was one that I loved. I ate them a lot. It was like my favorite vegetable, right? Mm -hmm. Or fruit, you know, fruit <laughs> depending on who you ask. I think it's a vegetable still. But, <laughs> but I said tomatoes is the thing that I ate the most. And, and she's like, yeah, you need to eliminate that from your diet. And I remember I, I did for a while and it, and it actually really helped. Um, but, you know, that was based on blood type. So it, when you do this test for a parent, for an mm -hmm. adult. Mm -hmm. Is it a is it a spit swab? No, it's all stool. So it's still poop for an it's, adult. Yeah, it's still pool. And yeah. you can track mm -hmm. gut, gut health mm -hmm. just as accurately as you could from like a blood sample. No, you can't track um, gut health from blood because that's all. your no. Because okay. that's your blood, right? So we have um, 38 trillion microbes in and on us. You have skin microbes. So there's different ecosystems of microbes in and on us. You have skin, you have oral. So your oral microbiome will be, will be completely different from your skin or, or uh, gut. Yeah. You have your vaginal community. Um, you have your, your gut community is basically your large intestines, right? That's where the most number of microbes live actually. Uh, is in your gut. And that has been the most studied colony, so to speak, microbiome colony in and on a person that is most associated with health or disease. So, it, you know, to, to get, and, and it's well studied because it's easy to get that sample from the stool. Interesting. Okay. You're going to realize quickly how little I know about health and this and these sort of things that's okay i mean I, I think that you know a lot a lot of people now have heard of gut health it's kind of trendy yeah. but they don't understand truly what it means does, right do you think blood type does blood type actually correlate with gut health in your opinion no, no. it doesn't it's, no. it's like foo foo. yeah yeah okay because i was i was very skeptical of this i i tried it all I'm, it's very anecdotal based on like how I'm feeling, right? But mm -hmm. there's no like, I didn't do any tests or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Why would somebody want to actually, as an adult, why would they want to change their microbiome? Well, I mean, it, it depends, right? Like, so as an adult, um, if you have symptoms and a lot of adults have some maybe bloat, bloating issue or constipation or, you know, it's, it's kind of like any, you know, and, and unfortunately a lot of, there's a rise of chronic conditions in, in even adults, right? Autoimmune conditions, metabolic issues, which means your glucose metabolism is in, you know, your, your body's not able to process that glucose um, as well. It's all linked back to your gut and what bacteria you have. So, for example, there's a, a really crucial 
bacteria called archimensia that's connected to metabolic health. So relevant to any adult, frankly. Um, if, you, if you don't have that, then your, your metabolic health is not as good. So for example, my husband has archimensia. And when he eats, so we have a CGM too that we wear from Levels Health. It measures your glucose spikes yeah, yeah, after you put eating. It, put it in your arm, stick in your arm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I measure a lot of things. Uh, you know, which you is wear one right now? I, yeah. I'm wearing one nice. right now. Yeah, we can see what our dinner is like tonight. <laughs> so um, when he eats the same things, he, I would spike and he wouldn't spike um, because I didn't have that archimensia. So I've been, there's a supplement um, for archimensia right now and there's certain diet like polyphenol rich foods that I can eat more of to help me um, get more of that microbe, for example, so yeah. that I can improve my metabolic health. So I'm not so sluggish every time I eat something that spikes me and things like that, right? Yeah, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. There's this guy that I follow a little bit on social media who does these, um, like, glucose monitor videos, and they're really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and he's done them on, like, hundred, maybe hundreds or thousands of different types of food and drinks and things like that. And stuff that, like, the label actually says, like, no, this is good. Like, you look at the label, and it's like, mm -hmm. oh, this is good. It's all organic. It's all natural. It's whatever. Mm -hmm. And then he drinks it, and it's like, oh, look at my blood pressure. It spiked. It went mm -hmm. through the roof. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of the health decisions that I make today are actually based on, like, his recommendation of that. Mm. The question is, could just because he spiked blood pressure-wise, does that mean I'm going to spike and that you're going to No, spike? everyone is individual. Could which is different, right? Yeah, it comes back to personalization, right? Yeah. As I mentioned uh, it should never be a one size fits all. The same supplement or drink can work for someone and not work for the other person, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of why I do feel like this is a microbiome sequencing is at a cost where we can all afford it right now as a, a product. Like it used to be thousands of dollars to get that same technology using metagenomics. And now it's, we're, we're retailing at 199 Still not the cheapest, but the cost is definitely dropping every year yeah. um, and becoming more affordable. So, yeah, I think like, you know, um, it depends what you're looking for. If, are you looking to optimize your health? Are you looking to reduce symptoms? Um, so, like, I, I think that you should, for me, I'm, I'm a person who loves data. I like to make data-driven decisions, even when it comes to health. Um, so if, as an adult, I'm optimizing my health through data, through my sleep and, you know, metabolic health and all that, then for me, it's like when I had my babies, like, why wouldn't I want to optimize their health through their gut health when it's so significant for their lifelong health? Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Do you also wear like a whoop or uh, any sort of wearable tracker? On? Not, I used to wear basis, the basis watch. Um, I think they sold to Intel or something. Um, that was, yeah, that was one of the first trackers that measured even sweat perspiration. Um, I used to have a sleep tracker. Uh, but no, now, now I'm kind of like, I'm just doing one thing at a time now. So I'm doing the microbiome tracking, obviously, and yeah. I'm doing the CGM. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's cool. And you said the CGM's only $189 now? The CGM's, yeah. um, I think it's $199. Yeah, levels. I mean, that's yeah. like crazy affordable. I mm -hmm. think everybody should try that. I'm going to, um, I made a note of that. I'm going to make sure that I get one of those soon because yeah. I'm really interested in tracking it. It's, it's something that you just wear for two weeks um, or you get two, I believe you have to get two as a package. So you get, uh, and you can wear it like two weeks at a time. So I would do like one for two weeks and then wait for two, like a couple of months and do another one because I would make some changes in between and see if that actually changes my, like, like my behavior. Yeah. The hardest thing about adults is um, it's really freaking hard to change our habits, right? Um, I mean, talking about dietary changes or adding a new supplement, it's, it's freaking hard. But I believe in real-time data, seeing that like data um, from your own like metabolic health, your glucose spiking, or your gut microbiome uh, with, with health insights motivates you to make those changes yeah. versus just reading about something. I know I, I, yeah, I shouldn't totally. be drinking alcohol. I know totally. I shouldn't be eating processed food, but you know, you succumb to it, right? So having this keeps me on my toes and reminds me uh, to keep up with it. Um, and, and yeah, so that's kind of why I, I, I do believe in um, tracking your own data. Amazing. Um, I want to, we're going to wrap here soon, but I, I definitely want to touch on one more thing, which is that 
I, I, I want to ask you about top founder qualities. You were, uh, you have a you have a VC that's a partner to you named Ariana Thacker, and she wrote a post on LinkedIn when they made the investment in Tiny Health, and she stated that you were three things: you were laser focused, you were high integrity, and highly strategic. Um, do you believe those are your three top? qualities as a founder, and in addition to that, what do you think uh, the best founder qualities are? Wow, that's a loaded question. Um, let's see. Well, let, what comes to mind uh, maybe was what happened recently in my company. We were talking about my engine, like an engineer who's like, you know, we're, we're at a, such a good growth stage right now that a lot of, we're a small team of like maybe 12 people, and everyone's feeling like, oh my gosh, like when we do raise more money and I don't want to be left out, how do I kind of like, you know, not just do the, the work I'm doing right now, how do I up myself and do more strategic work and things like that? Um, and, and basically I was kind of like advising this, some teammates, uh, my employees, that the, the best engineers or the best kind of teammates know when to, you know, pick technologies that we need in the, the, the right now, like the next year, not necessarily two years from now, because we may not, you know, live to see two years. So, but, you know, kind of understand the trade-offs that you're, uh, that you're making now to make it work. And I realized that maybe that is kind of the skill that I have in terms of, you know, as CEO and founder, you're making these small little mini decisions every single day for how much to invest, who to hire, what budget to put on marketing or how much to invest in product versus, you know, the long-term vision of the product that would take months to build versus something that you can execute right now. So I think that is a skill that is maybe um, something that I've, I've honed over the, the years to have a very, like, like Ariana said, laser focused vision for what we want to accomplish. Um, and strategize towards that, but at the same time, um, sort of be very involved and detailed in the execution of it uh, and not be distracted, um, if that makes sense. So I think a lot of founders have more either one or the other, right? They kind of have, are the more visionary founders mm -hmm. who are like think big, but they maybe are not kind of like day-to-day -day operationally like, you know, good at uh, or vice versa. I think I have a good balance of both. Yeah, mm -hmm. amazing. Um, and to wrap, what's the what's the top piece of advice you'd give for um, those who are listening who are aspiring to be found founders one day? So I think uh, it was something that I mentioned earlier, which is I see a lot of founders today who may want to outsource a certain piece of their um, business out. And I think... I think this has to be thought carefully through. If you're building a technology company, I feel like it's it's so hard to outsource an engineer, like to some engineer sitting elsewhere in a different country. Maybe if it's a technology enabled company, but even then, when we started, we, we did feel like the technology is enabling the results portal that you're reading. Yeah. It's a content, you know, portal, right? But, you know, having that engineer in-house um, makes a huge difference in how quickly you iterate based on customer and market responses and you keep that knowledge with you, right? It's not kind of like with, with an agency, you're not retaining that knowledge. So that was crucial when we were building that product, um, similar with my scientists. So at different stages of the company, you really need to know when you should bring that in-house versus outsource. Um, even marketing, I see a lot of founders kind of like, okay, I'm just going to put 50K into a marketing agency and let them run it. But again, it's so removed from the core of your messaging, your product. I, We were able to like basically run marketing with so few dollars because we brought in a freelancer who executed on our campaigns. And because I was executing it so closely with her that all I was able to retain all that. Now we're at a stage where we are hiring an agency, but I feel like if you hire, if you bring in outside outsourcing too soon, you you lose a lot of learnings at the beginning. So, uh, yeah, that would be my my advice. Amazing. Well, mm -hmm. thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for opening up. This is 
you're doing your great work. It's very noble, I might say. So excited to have dinner tonight and catch up more. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching another episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. It was amazing to have Cheryl Sue Hoy on the podcast today, the founder of Tiny Health. And the three key learnings that we learned from today's podcast with Cheryl were the first one, all about scrappiness. Uh, even if you're going to do your first first company, second company, third company, that scrappiness cannot go away. You have to continue to have it. You'll start to be able to refine your scrappiness over time so you can hone it in and use it to your advantage. The second one is you got to earn it. If you're going to be a founder, you got to act like a founder. I love the story about sleeping on a cot after you know having lived in a really nice apartment in New York City and just scrapping and getting by and acting like a founder. I think that's crucial. And the last one is key roles. They just need to be insourced. Uh, things like a CTO or a CMO, it's really difficult to outsource those. They're not going to care deeply about the product that you have and they're not going to really understand the vision and the culture of the company and be able to relate to that and, and build for the future. So thank you again for joining another episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast, and we'll see you on the next one.